Naming alkenes is going to be the topic of this lesson. Now we have a whole chapter on alkene reactions, but we're going to learn how to name them first. So we're going to cover all the rules for naming alkenes. We'll definitely talk about uh, different stereoisomers, the EZ system of nomenclature, and then we'll name polyalkenes at the end of this lesson as well. This is part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I release a new lesson. All right, so naming alkenes. And just a reminder, alkenes have a carbon-carbon double bond somewhere in the structure. And if you notice this top one does not have a carbon-carbon double bond yet, I will add it in a sec. But if you are going to name this as an alkane, just as a review, so it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons, and that would simply be heptane. So what happens when you have a double bond, so it's going to be named as part of the parent chain. So, but for alkenes, so instead of saying ane at the end of the parent chain, you're going to say ene. And so instead of heptane, this is going to be heptene. So, but it turns out that is not sufficient. So because the double bond could have been located in one of several different positions, and so you actually got to give a, uh, use a chain locator to identify its position as well. And so in this case, you find your longest continuous chain that contains the carbon-carbon double bond. Usually it's your longest continuous carbon chain overall, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case here. You want specifically the longest continuous carbon chain that your alkene is a part of. So, all right, then you want to number it in such a way to give it the lowest possible number. So here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And in this case, the alkene is between carbons one and two, and you always give it the lower of the two designations. So it's going to be located at position number one. And so instead of saying just heptane, like it was an alkane, and instead of just saying heptene, which doesn't give its chain locator, we're actually going to say hept-1-ene. This is the most accepted way. So you'll find out usually acceptable also, though, in this case is to say 1-heptene as well. So you'll find out when you've got multiple functional groups that are part of the parent chain's name that you're going to get stuck putting the number in the middle of the word right before the little suffix here that identifies it as an alkene. So, but if the alkene is the only major functional group in your parent chain, then you can actually put the one out front as I've done there as well. All right, so that's the first one. Start off easy. Let's make this harder. So next example, uh, find your longest continuous carbon chain that the alkene's a part of. And so in this case, starting from this branch point here, whether I go to these two carbons or to these two, it is the same length either way. It doesn't make a difference. So uh, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, whether I go up or down doesn't matter. So and that'll be the seventh. And in this case, we want to number it such a way to get the alkene the lowest possible number. So in this case, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. So we'll number left to right, give it that lower number three. Cool. And then we start this out just the same way we name alkanes and you name all the substituents first. And so in this case, what's not part of that parent chain? Well, we have got an ethyl group right here on, attached at carbon three. And then we've got a methyl group down here attached at carbon six. And you name all your substituents in alphabetical order. So we'll name the ethyl first. And so in this case, we will say three ethyl, then six methyl. And in this case, to name that alkene, uh, again, you're going to give it the lower of, of the two numbers. It's between carbons three and four. So we're going to name it as being at position three. Longest chain is seven carbons again. So it's going to be heptene. But instead of saying heptene, we got to give that chain locator again. So we'll say hept-3-ene. Now, in this case, we also could have said it one other way here. And we could have said three heptene as well at the end. So it would have been three ethyl, six methyl, three heptene. And most professors have no problem accepting either one of those as acceptable, acceptable IUPAC names. So, but you'll find that the top one though is, is kind of the more proper. This is kind of the old school, but the more proper, but again, both should be acceptable. All right, so what if we got a cycloalkene in this case? So if you got a cycloalkene, assuming the alkene is the most important functional group in your ring, then those two carbons have to be carbons, not just one, but one and two. You have to number through that alkene. And so the question then becomes, do I want to say like one and two, or do I want to go one and two? 
So one of the mistakes students make is they often you know, don't realize that they actually have to make these the first two carbons. Like they just want to start with him as number one and then number around this way to get the substituents the lowest number. But it's both carbons of the alkenes that have to get the lowest numbers. Uh, and that's why you get a number through. So, but in this case, uh, whether it's one and two or one and two makes no difference as far as the alkene goes, but it will make a big difference for our substituents. And so in this case, we'll, we're going to number this around clockwise as we did in red here. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we will name this, uh, the substituents first again. So three, three dimethyl. All right, and then this is cyclohex, not ane, but cyclohexene. So, and what you'll find here, though, is that if you're naming it cyclohexene as your parent chain, well, then the alkene is the only functional group in that parent chain, and therefore, by definition in a ring, it would have had to have been between carbons one and two and been at position one. And when that's the case, when it's cyclic, notice we didn't, this wasn't the case when it was on an open chain, when it was at position one, we had to include it as part of the name. But when it's in, uh, in a ring here, you don't include it as part of the ring, it's totally implied. So no chain locator, it's not that those chain, leader, uh, chain locators needed, it's that you don't put it in. If you put it in there, you might lose half a point on something like this. All right, so now let's talk about stereoisomers. So, reminder, the carbon-carbon double bond in an alkene is not free to rotate. You got that sideways overlap of p orbitals, and if you rotate the bond, you'd break the double bond. So, no rotation here, and that leads to different stereoisomers being possible. So, in this case, you guys learned back in the chapter on stereochemistry that cis and trans isomers were possible with alkenes, and that they are diastereomers, as is the case here. So, and back in the day, we were referred to this one as cis and this one is trans, but that actually is not gonna be good enough. That's not gonna be quite enough uh, because the cis and trans here, uh, you gotta talk about what actually is cis and what actually is trans. And in this case, we actually could use it. If both of the carbons of the alkene have a hydrogen, and I'll draw those hydrogens in that weren't drawn, and they each got one. And if they've got one each, you can actually use the cis and trans system of nomenclature. It's not proper, it's not IUPAC, but you can use it. So. And in this case, uh, if you look at the two H's are only pointing 60 degrees apart, and that's when it's cis, but when they point 180 degrees apart, that's trans. So, but what if both sides don't actually have an H? So that's one problem. So, and then two, recognizing when you've got to use cis or trans or what we're going to call E and Z. So, but it turns out that, you know, not all alkenes actually uh, exhibit cis-trans isomerism. So as long as both sp2 carbons of the alkene are bonded to two different groups, it'll be capable of uh, exhibiting cis-trans isomerism, or if it's not part of a smaller ring. So if it's in a smaller ring, it's just gonna be in the conformation that's in, but if it's in a larger ring, or again, if both sp2 carbons are bonded to two different groups, it will exhibit cis-trans isomerism. So in this case, sp2 carbon on the left is bonded to a carbon of a methyl and a hydrogen. So sp2 carbon on the right is bonded to the carbon of an ethyl and a hydrogen. Both sp2 carbons are bonded to two different things. And that, yes, indeed, we're going to have cis-trans isomerism. And all you got to do to get the other isomer is take either side and have the two groups trade places, which is what we've done to get the trans isomer over here. So I left these two alone, the ethyl and the hydrogen, on the right-hand side, just had these two trade places. So, but instead of cis and trans, we're actually going to use what's called E and Z. And the E, the couple, couple of German words, entgegen and zusimonen, doesn't matter. So, but E is going to be analogous to, uh, to trans, and Z is going to be analogous to cis. And I like to say that your two like priority groups are on the same side. So, as the stupid mnemonic we kind of emphasize there, the alliteration. So, in this case, what you're going to do is actually assign priorities. So to the two groups, a higher and a lower, and, and truth be told, we're just gonna really worry about the higher. So, and it's the same way you assign R and S. So in this case, to this sp2 carbon, it's bonded to a carbon and a hydrogen. Carbon's got the higher atomic number, and so it's gonna have the higher priority. On the other side, so again, hydrogen versus carbon, carbon, has a higher atomic number, so that group's gonna get the higher priority, just like we assigned priorities with R and S, but instead of assigning like four priorities, each side just has a higher and a lower, and just circle those hires, you relate those two. And when those two higher priorities are on the same side, when they're cis to each other, we will refer to that as the Z isomer, and we'll put that out in front in parentheses, just like we'd put R or S out in front when we're naming stereoisomers that have R and S chiral centers. So, and in this case, then we'll name the rest of this, and this alkene, one, two, three, four, 
five, named to get the alkene the lowest possible numbers. And in this case, this is pentuene or two pentene, but I'll call it pentuene. So Z pentuene. Cool, now on the other side here, if we circled again those high priority groups, they would now be trans to each other. So they're not cis, they're trans, and that corresponds to E. Cool. So, and that's how the nomenclature kind of works with E and Z. So one, you got to kind of, you know, drug up those con ingled prelog rules for assigning priorities and then relate your two higher priority groups. If they're only 60 degrees apart, that's going to be cis, which now corresponds to Z as the proper IUPAC name. And if they're 180 degrees apart, which was trans, that's going to correspond to E as part of the IUPAC name. All right, for these next two, we're not actually gonna name these two, I just want you to assign E and Z. So you might take a moment and pause this and assign E and Z and we'll measure it up together. Now the first one here is easier than the second. So if we take a look again, those sp2 carbons, the sp2 carbon on the left is bonded to two groups, a bromine and a hydrogen. And the bromine's got the higher atomic number, life is good. And on the right hand side, that sp2 carbon's bonded to a chlorine and a carbon. Chlorine's got the higher atomic number. And here we can see that the two higher priority groups are only 60 degrees apart. They are cis to each other, i.e. they are on the same side. They're Z. This is the Z isomer here in this case. But the next example is a little trickier. We'll definitely need a full application of our uh, con ingold prelog rules here. And for the sp2 carbon on the left, it's bonded to two identical groups. It is bonded to a carbon and a carbon. And so then we've got to say, well, then what are those carbons bonded to? Well, this carbon down here is bonded to one other carbon and then not drawn in is two hydrogens. So in this carbon up here is bonded to a fluorine and then two hydrogens that are not drawn in. And so the first place where they're different is comparing carbon to fluorine. Fluorine's got the higher atomic number. And so this is the higher priority on the left-hand side. And then your right-hand sp2 carbon is also bonded to two carbons. So there's a tie. So we go further and this carbon down here is bonded to three H's that are not drawn in. Whereas this one over here is bonded to two carbons and a hydrogen. We can see the first point where it's different. Carbon's gonna beat hydrogen. And so this will be the higher priority group. And now we can see the two higher priority groups, again, only 0.60 degrees apart. They're cis to each other. And once again, this would be a Z isomer as well. Cool, takes a little practice, works several examples, but should be fairly reminiscent of what you did with RNS. All right, for our last example here, we're gonna name a polyalkane. And when you've got a polyalkane, you wanna find your longest continuous carbon chain that contains all of the alkenes if possible. It's not always possible, but as many as possible is the case here. And so in this case, we will get a longest carbon chain that does indeed contain all of the alkenes. And so in this case, it'll be three alkenes and we'll call that a triene. So, and that's gonna be part of the parent name. So it turns out with just one alkene, you might look in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nonane becomes nonene for a single alkene. So, but if you had two alkenes, it would be nonadiene. And since diene begins with a consonant, we pull that A back in on non-adiene. So we don't have like non-diene, a, a, a consonant, consonant sound. So it'd be non-adiene. And with three of them here, it's going to be non-triene for the parent name. And again, we will have to include those chain locators as well. Now, in this case, once we've identified our longest chain, which we just identified as nine carbons, you want to number it in such a way that the first alkene you encounter gets the lowest possible number. So if I go left to right, I will hit an alkene at carbon two. But if I go right to left, I'll hit an alkene at carbon one. And so we'll number this right to left here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All right, so if we look here, it's just like normal, we're gonna name uh, the substituents first. And we've got substituents at carbon three here, there's a methyl, at carbon four here, there's an ethyl, and at carbon seven here, there's another methyl. We'll name ethyl before methyl in the alphabet, and so we're gonna say four ethyl, and then three seven dimethyl. All right, now the fun. We've got non-triene. So, but in this case, we gotta give three different chain locators at position one, position four, and position seven. So, and you're best to put those in the, in, in the actual word before you say triene. So in this case, nana, and then dash, one, four, seven.
triene. Cool, but that is not a sufficient name as well. And one thing you should get in the habit of doing whenever you name an alkene is you should check for stereoisomers. Are cis and trans or E and Z possible? And in this case, it's not always possible. And like uh, we mentioned this before, and we didn't kind of point it out explicitly, but the first few examples we gave, if you go back and look at them, so they're either inside a small ring, like a six-membered ring, which you can't have uh, different isomers in that case. So it's not enough, sterically enough room for that to be possible. So, but then also, is if either carbon of the alkene is bonded to two identical groups, there's no cis and trans, no easy isomerism that exists. So like in this case, this carbon right here of this alkene is bonded to two identical hydrogens. There's no cis and trans, no E and Z associated with that. It only exists in one possible uh, conformation. So no E and Z. So, but this one right here, this carbon four, this sp2 carbon is bonded to two different carbons and they're definitely different. They're not, not equivalent at all. And on the other side, this guy's bonded to a carbon and then a hydrogen that's not drawn in. That's two different groups. And so he's gonna exhibit E and Z isomerism. We have to figure out which of those two we have. So go to the other alkene here and this carbon over here, this sp2 carbon is bonded to two carbons and they're definitely not equivalent carbons, they're different. And on this side, this sp2 carbon is bonded to a carbon and then a hydrogen that's not drawn in, so they're different. So he's gonna have E and Z as well. So two of these, two out of the three, we actually gotta sign E and Z. Let's go through and do that. So for carbon four, uh, notice I circled in red, so I'm gonna use blue to circle the higher priorities now. And in this case, we've got this carbon and this carbon. This carbon's bonded to a carbon and two H's. So C, H, H. This carbon's bonded to two carbons and then a hydrogen that's not drawn in, so C, C, H, and he's going to win. And technically I should circle the whole group he's a part of as the higher priority. And on the other side, this guy's bonded to a carbon and a hydrogen, and carbons are definitely gonna win. Instead of circling the whole thing, this is gonna get messy. I'll just do this, but I can see that the two groups that we've circled for higher priorities point 180 degrees apart, and that corresponds to E. And then we'll do the one at number seven here as well. And on the right-hand side, we've got two carbons. This one's bonded to three H's. This one's bonded to a carbon and two H's and gonna get the higher priority here as well. So I'm circling it again for this guy. And then on the other side, this guy's bonded to a carbon and then also a hydrogen that wasn't drawn in. Carbon's definitely gonna win. And in this case, these are once again pointing 180 degrees apart. And so it also is in the E configuration or E conformation. And here's the deal, when you've got more than one uh, alkene that needs a, a stereochemical designation, just like you did with R and S, if you only got one, you just say R or you just say S. Same thing here, you just say E or you just say Z. But the moment you have more than one of them to designate, you gotta give locations as well. So if you just said EE -E at the beginning of this name, that's not gonna be sufficient. You're gonna have to tell me in brackets four, in parentheses I should say, four E, 7E, in parentheses, dash, 4-ethyl, 3-7-dimethyl, nana, 1-4-7-triene. It is a mouthful. So, but this is how we name polyalkenes. And once again, if you have more than one E or Z designation, you got to include the numbers at the beginning as well. If you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Or if you just feel sorry for short bald guys, please consider giving me a like and a share. One of the best things you can do to help support the channel. If you were looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems on naming alkenes or any of the alkene reactions that you're gonna learn in this chapter, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.